Hey, uh, thanks for being here this morning. I know you could be at any church in, the, in this Central Coast, and you chose Active Church to worship with us. So thank you for being here. And thank you for being in the house. There's something about making, uh, making an effort, getting up, getting out of your PJs, uh, putting on some clothes and, and, and some church clothes. And you guys look good. You look good today. And I'm glad that you're here. Uh, I got a word for you from God. I feel like I got a word today. I got a word. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, I got paper notes, so you know it's going to be... It'll be interesting. Let me get situated real quick. Hey, um, excited. Um, I gotta just tell you right off the bat, um, I'm excited. Uh, I'm really pumped. Uh, if you guys have been following um, our story, we, over the last, uh, gosh, 37, 38 days, we've been in the NIC unit with my, our uh, youngest baby, baby boy, baby Easton. And uh, we just yesterday got to give him a bath for the first time. And uh, he's doing really well. So thank you for praying for my son. Um, he is, uh, he's 37 days old. He's now a whopping three pounds, two ounces, and, uh, he's breathing well. His, uh, blood is good. His heart rate's good. He's trending in the right direction. And, uh, he was born at just 26 weeks. So he was a little two pound, four ounce little nugget when he was born. And by the grace of God, here we are 37 days later. So I know that God gets all the glory for that, but, um, I'm excited. Hey, I want to do something real quick. I want to look right at the camera in the back and welcome everyone joining us online. Active Church, would you give a big welcome to all of our online guests? Come on. Thank you for jumping on this morning. I want to um, start off today. Today's talk is going to be about men. So we'll be here for about 10 minutes and then we'll get on the way. Okay, guys? <laughs> just kidding. I'm going to say something that I might get canceled for right now. So it, I'll, I'll just say it. <clears throat> Men are just as complicated as women. You're like, are you saying that I'm complicated? No, I'm not saying it. But culture has said that for many years. Um, and I'm just agreeing that, that women aren't more complicated than men. We're all just our own. We're equally complicated just in different ways. Can I get an amen? We are all complicated, but men are just as complicated. Um, and, and here's, I didn't want to tell you I was going to talk about men because most of the time when you tell someone, tell a guy that we're going to do a sermon about men, they won't go to church. Because here's why. Most sermons about men are like, do better, stop watching this, start reading your Bible more, you suck, now let's go home and be better, let's just try harder. And that's most of the sermons. And I preached some of those messages and guess what? They don't work that well. They don't. And maybe you're here today and you're like, what's he going to talk about? We're going to talk about men. And um, I thought about how I wanted to kind of frame this talk. So I thought I would do something. Uh, talk. I'll explain this. Um, everyone in here has dreams, okay? Yeah, not like dreams of being something when you're, you know, what, like a vision. But like you dream at night. Raise your hand if you ever have a dream. Raise your hand. All of you, okay. Someone's like, nope, not me. Never dream. No REM for me. No, we all dream. Some of you don't remember your dreams. Like my wife, rare, my wife will wake up. She only remembers the dreams that I did something stupid in. She'll like wake up mad at me. Like I had a bad dream about you. She's like, I'm mad at you. I'm like, well, I didn't do anything. Your brain did it to, to, to yourself. Um, but um, I, I, I think we all have dreams. Like I have dream, I have weird dreams. I have dreams. Like I had a dream on Tuesday and I told my kids, like I had this dream and we were in a field playing catch and, and and yeah, uh, we were in a field playing catch and bricks and everything was fine. And we're playing baseball and all of a sudden the ball started floating away. And then all of a sudden the whole field became a giant magnet, like polar opposite magnets. And I was like, we must run. And we had to run out. I'm like, my son was like, tell me more. I'm like, dreams are crazy. Like, I can't wait to ask God about dreams. We all have dreams, don't we? And, and, and sometimes you have good dreams. We're like, have you had the flying dream? You ever had that dream? Have you ever had the dream where you knew you were dreaming? And you're like, I'm dreaming right now. And like, it only lasts for a minute or so. And then and you wake up you're like, dang it, I wanted to do something cool, right? But then we have like dreams that are weird, right? Or bad. And, and here's kind of one of the frame the talk was, we've all, I've had this dream, maybe you've had it too, where you've had to like fight somebody, but you couldn't use your arms. You ever had that dream? You're just like, because you're just laying in your bed. Or maybe you've had, I've had this dream where I was in trouble, and I needed help. And I knew I had people that were near me, like friends and people that I could count on. And in my dream, I remember 
trying to scream as loud as I could. You ever had this dream? And you're trying to scream, but nothing comes out of your mouth. Has anyone had that dream before? You're screaming in silence and it feels like nobody is hearing you. And I've just described nearly every man in this room at a certain point of their life where they were screaming in silence and no one heard them. Now, you're saying, really, Adam, every guy in this room has had this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Statistically, yes. Matter of fact, um, a recent study surveyed about 70% of all men have gone through a secret depression in their life. And you're like, that's, I don't think that's true. I never heard my husband talk about that. It's because it's secret. He didn't tell you about it, ladies. He didn't want to tell you about it because he had to look strong. And, and, and the guys are not amending right now. And it got real quiet in here because everyone's going, yep. Seven out of 10, line them up, yep. And if you're the three out of 10, God bless you, man. God bless you. But for the rest of us, yep. 85% of all suicides in America happen, guess what? In the category of men. Women outlive their spouses on average uh, 10 to 15 years on average. You will, you will look at your husband right now and be like, I'm gonna outlive you, see? See, the re- reality is every single one of us, every single man in here, and I'm gonna talk about men for a little bit, every single man in here has gone through something in the last few years where they're like, man, I, something was going on in my life and I didn't wanna talk about it. And I wanna read to you where I think the war started. It starts with, within, and I'm gonna go all the way back to Genesis because as you can tell, there's a war within is the title of my message. You can write that down if you're online. You can just say, war within. Let us know you're watching. But this is the idea that there's an iceberg and what you see on top of the iceberg is only 10 to 15% of the actual size of the iceberg. But what's happening underneath, that's, that's the, really the reality of so many of us. There's a lot more going on inside than we can see and there's a war within. And I wanna take us all the way back to Genesis chapter one. So I wanna read Genesis chapter one in the beginning. If you look at the, the, the story or the narrative throughout scripture, there's four major themes. You have creation, You have the fall, you have redemption and glorification. We're at the fall. This is literally on my Bible, it says the fall. Here's what it says, Genesis chapter three, verse one through six. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say, pause, I would submit to you that most of our bad decisions did not start with a simple act of sin or a simple decision to go and do something stupid. Most of our decisions started with a question, how close can I get to this thing without actually doing something bad? How close, did God really say not to do this thing? It starts with the war within before it happens outside of you. And he goes, Satan goes, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, We may eat fruit from the trees of the the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman, watch this, and when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and she ate it. And likewise, she went and gave some to her husband and he ate it too. And that was the moment. And since that moment, I believe every single, that the enemy has been waging war within all of us, but I'm gonna talk about guys for a few minutes today because every single guy in here, I believe has been struggling with three questions since that moment, since sin entered. Every single guy has been asking three questions and I wanna talk about those three questions today. And here's the first question of the three questions. You guys ready? If you're taking notes, write this down. Here's question number one. Do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes? I, pray, I talked about this a little bit a few weeks ago, but I wanna unpack this even more. Um, manhood gets described in all sorts of weird ways, doesn't it? 
Like, like if you're, I, I got, remember I started following Jesus and I remember thinking to myself, like, I need to figure out what it means to be a man, like a biblical man. Like, I want to be a man of, of, of integrity and I, and I want to be a, a godly man. And I remember reading a great book by a guy named John Eldridge called Wild at Heart. Remember that book? Wild at Heart. Great book. Great, I love the book. But I remember thinking to myself, like, <laughs> it starts talking about a definition of a man, like a man needs to be outside in the wilderness and hunting and camping and, and, and being outdoors and, and building stuff with his hands and, and all these things. And I'm like, and I remember thinking to myself, like, I like camping for like a couple days, okay? Like I'll sleep on a sleeping bag in a cot, like no problem for like a day, two, maybe three days. I like to hike, I like to golf, I like to be outside, I like to snowboard. I like all those things, but like I prefer like a Marriott. Uh, <coughs> Like I prefer like a jacuzzi tub with my wife and, and, and like having like a nice view, having a comfortable bed. Like I started thinking like maybe if that's manhood, maybe I don't have what it takes to be a man. Anyone with me? You're like, I don't know if I ascribe to that definition because I, I just, maybe there's times where I, yeah, I want to be outside in the outdoors, but man, sometimes like I'd rather just be inside where it's nice and warm and comfortable and I don't know if I have what it takes to be a man. And what happens is if we don't talk about this, pressure will build up in you and you will eventually think, I don't know if I have what it takes because every man in here is under a certain amount of pressure. You're all under pressure. I'm under pressure. You're under pressure, right? Like if we had a bench press right here, like you go to the gym, right? And, and if you have a bench press, you throw in some 45s right there. Like I could, 135, I could rep that out. I, I got that easy, okay? I'm not that strong, but I can hit 135 pretty easy, okay? I can do it, you know, 12 times, boom, boom, boom. Two more plates, 225. It's gonna be hard. I can get it up though. Oh, I can get it up, boom. Maybe one, twi twice. You put 300 pounds on that thing, I'm not gonna get it up. I'm gonna, it's gonna fall on me. I might be able to like rescue myself by rolling it off me. You put 400 pounds on that bench press, it's crushing me. It's too much pressure. I'm gonna fall under the pressure. I will, I will die. I will literally die unless someone saves me. Some of you guys are like, I could do 400. Okay, great, awesome, praise God for you. But at a certain point, your pressure, you can only take so much pressure, am I right? You can only handle so much weight and eventually every single man will get to a point in his life where he's gonna go, I tap, it's too much, I can't do it, it's too hard, there's too much pressure and they're asking, we're all asking the question, do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes to be a husband? You know, Okay, I'm just gonna say this. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep saying things, so, okay. When I grew up, boys did not prepare to be in relationships. Girls did. I don't know what it was like when you grew up, but when I grew up, girls had Ken and Barbie. Girls had easy bake ovens. Like my sister had an easy bake oven. My sister played with Barbies. I was outside shooting things with my BB gun and lighting things on fire. And I'd come in and I would literally, I would play and I would play house with my sister and I would be Ken for a little while. And I remember, Nicole, I'm sorry for this. I still, I still feel bad. I broke the legs off of Ken and then they hung around in his silver pants like this, all broken. And she's like, mom, and my mom got mad at me. That was $20. Why? Because I like to break stuff, light things on fire, and I was not practicing how to be in a relationship. I was outside doing safe. And maybe you're like, I was a tomboy, and that's not me. Okay, you're the exception. But a lot of women were practicing how to play house long before they could even remember. And men and boys are just outside doing silly things, jumping off of things, playing war, getting into fights, getting dirty. And for the most part, those are kind of the things that we did. And girls... You had practice, we did not. And so we asked the question, do I have what it takes? Did you know that the books that are sold, 70% of the books that are bought by women are fiction? And guess what they're about? Romance. That's why they call it fiction. You're like, I'm still waiting to meet this guy. That's why the Twilight books were so popular. Oh my gosh, Edward, Team Jacob. And listen up, ladies, I, can I tell you something? Most, most of the things you learn about men, you learn about from other women, right? Oh, let me tell you about men. 
let me just tell, let me tell you about men. And you're like, aunt so-and-so, you don't even have a man right now. Why are you trying to lecture me? <laughs> don't, don't, you can email me at richardbergman at myactivechurch.org. <laughs> And, and what happens is this, let me tell you, you learn things about men from other women and it's not actually true, some of it. Maybe some of it is, but very few women get information about men from men. And you say things like, well, he's just so shut down. He's so shut down, he just doesn't open up. He's just, I ask him how he's doing, he says, fine. And then I just wanna to talk to him, he doesn't wanna to talk to me. And, and, and you're like, I just don't know what's going on. He's just so shut down. And you tell your girlfriends, he just doesn't open up. He doesn't open up. Here's why. He's too busy wrestling with the question, do I have what it takes to even be your husband? Because I know that I fall short and I know that I'm not all the, the man that you always need me to be. And I'm wrestling with the pressure of providing and being a good man and a good husband. And then you throw Christianity into it. And now you're walking with this mantle like, can I carry any more weight? And if we're not careful, this will become a burden to be this godly man and not walk in freedom. We'll think I gotta do more rules and don't do bad things and don't look at that. And we'll, we'll feel the pressure. Am I talking to any men in the house today? And here's what I know. Men are asking the question, do I have what it takes? And a lot of men shut down. You wanna know why? Because a man will not play a game he doesn't think he can win at. Just look at, just look at, look at two guys playing a video game against each other. If you play, <laughs> just watch. there's relationships, friendships that have ended over a Mortal Kombat game in 1995 on Sega Genesis. Because some dude's getting whooped up. He's like, this is so stupid. This game's so, you just press all the buttons. This game, and they ended it. Off, done, I'm going home. No, seriously, a guy will not play a game that he doesn't think he can win at. A guy will, a guy will go, this is dumb, I don't wanna play. If I can't win, I'm not gonna play. And so what happens is we end up, men end up feeling like, man, do I even have what it takes? Do I have what it takes to be a dad? Oh my gosh. Being a dad is flipping scary. They give you, they give you kids without even, like, you don't have to have a license. You don't have to pass a test. They just let you, you're 18 and, and you're on your own and all of a sudden you meet someone you like and you're like, ooh, I like her. And then you get married and you're like, this is gonna be awesome. And then you have a baby and they just give it to you. They don't give you training. They just say, here's the, here's the baby. And here's the, here's the reality. Uh, most men didn't have a model for what it means to be a godly dad. Most of us had to do on the job training, right? We had to figure it out. And some of us have made mistakes. And some of us go, do I really have what it takes to be a good dad? Do I have what it takes to be a good dad to my kids? Like, I'm, like honestly, like my daughter's 10 years old now. I love you, Hadley. I love you so much. But I'm starting to get to the place where I'm like, She's asking me things and she's watching me now and she's at an age where she can kind of point things out to me about my character flaws and she'll say, I kind of noticed you do this. Did you notice that? <laughs> it's not really nice. And I'm going, do I have what it takes to be the, the man of God, the dad, to, to, to raise up this little girl, raise up these boys to be men of God? I don't know. Do I have what it takes to be a follower of Jesus? Do I have what it takes to be a, a, a legit follower of Jesus? Do I have what it takes to be someone that's gonna be a person that, man, I'm a leader worth following, a, a, a Christian that's worth exempt. Like Paul said, hey, follow me. Like as I follow Christ, you follow me to Timothy. Like he's telling people like, hey, model your life. Like if I told everyone to model their Christianity, like behind the scenes where no one's watching me, like if everyone did what I did, would that be a better church or a worse church? If everyone prayed like me, if everyone studied the word like me, like would people be better or worse if they modeled my life? Like not just the, like not, not the Instagram life. I'm talking the behind the scenes, like no one sees stuff, like the integrity stuff. Like would they be, I hope we can all say that we would, but here's the reality. We're all, at, guys, we're asking the question, do I have what it takes to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus? And in a room like this, I guarantee, I guarantee, listen, there's not a man in this room, myself included, that hasn't felt like we've fallen short of being a follower of Jesus in our lifetime. There's not a man in this room. Question number two is, is this. Every man is asking this question. Can I trust you? Can I trust you? You're asking this of your friends. 
You're asking this of your significant other, your spouse, and you're asking this of God. Can, can I trust you, God? Can I trust you with my, my stuff, bro? Can I trust my wife with this or am I gonna be rejected? Can't I trust you? It's a very difficult process to get a man to open up, isn't it? And maybe you're like one of those men that are like, I'm very in touch with like my feminine side and you can open up and you're talkative. But most guys, you ever get a guy, a bunch of guys in a small group for the first time? Like guys that don't know each other, it's so awkward. Hey guys, welcome to the small group. We got some chips and dip here. Your facilitator, your accountability buddy. <laughs> we're gonna hold each other accountable, brothers. And we're gonna go and we're gonna get deep. And then you open, so you read a verse and then it's like, hey, so talk, let's talk about that. What's going on in your life? It's crickets. And then someone will eventually open up and confess a Christian sin. You know what a Christian sin is? Hey, brother, pray for me. I've only read my Bible five times this week. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can we all pray for Bill? praying for you, Bill. Because <laughs> really what we're asking is, I don't know if I can trust you. I don't know. Can I, tr can I trust you? Every man's asking this question because every person in here has had a moment in their life where they got burned by someone. They opened up and they said something and they shared something and that person, someone used that against them and they go, I ain't ever doing that again. Last time I did that, I got burned. So it's very difficult to get men to open up and they're asking, here, here I'll tell you what the difference between men and women. You ask, okay, you, yeah, if Stacy tomorrow asked me, where'd you go for lunch? I'd say, Chipotle. What'd you have? Steak burrito bowl, guac, chips and guac. It's delicious. If I ask Stacy, men and women, women are way different. They were way more open. Hey, babe, where'd you go for lunch? She'd be like, oh my gosh, I was craving Chipotle. So then I drove to Chipotle and I remembered, oh my gosh, I gotta go to Ulta because I forgot my makeup thing and I, I ran out of mascara and I'd be like, oh no, really? Okay. And then she'd be like, oh, I was at Ulta and I remember I had a, I had a, I had a gift card. I had a gift, remember the gift card I got from my mom at Christmas time? <laughs> Oh my gosh, I forgot to send her a card. You know, I got that gift card from my mom to Ulta and it was so cool. And then I went in there, I saw Sarah and I was like, oh my gosh, we're supposed to have lunch together. I was praying for a God moment and here you are. Do you want to go to Chipotle? And then she told me, no, she's going with Ross. And do you know Ross took her on a lunch date? We haven't been on a lunch date in a long time. And you were supposed to get together with them for like, we were supposed to have dinner like a month ago. Why didn't you do that? Make sure you schedule that. So anyways, I was at Ulta and then I realized, oh my gosh, I have something from Kohl's I got to return. Because remember that dress I wore at the wedding? And the guys are like, uh-huh. <laughs> if, you, if you, ladies, if you ever see your man like, uh-huh. Wow, cool. Oh, no, no way. No, she didn't. He's not listening to you. what I just say? What? <laughs> you said the thing about Ulta. Yeah, I said that five minutes ago. Can we just say women are more vocal? <laughs> guys are like, don't, don't hear that, no. Someone's like, amen. <laughs> Can I trust you? Can I trust you? Because that's what we're all really asking, aren't we? Can I trust you with my, my life? Can I trust you with my stuff? This is what I know. Men and women are very different, but can I tell you something? The reality for so many of us is that we can't trust people because we've been burned. But I know, here's what I know. Every single man that you know and every single man in here needs someone they can trust. Another dude. You mean accountability partner? No. That's a Christian... I don't need a parole officer. I don't need another person I have to perform for. I need someone that I can look at that can go, hey dude, you're messing up. And I can go, yep. I need someone that I can trust and be 100% with and go, 
Here, dude, can I be honest with you what happened yesterday? Here's what happened with me and my wife. Here's what happened to me the other day. I was tempted. Here's what happened to me. I got angry and I yelled at my wife. I yelled at my kid. I need someone that I could just be honest with and look eyeball to eyeball with that can challenge me, that can encourage me, that can call me out and call me up and say, hey, dude, that's wrong. You're better than that. I believe in you, bro. I love you. I'm not going to let you sit in that stuff. You are better than that. Thank you for telling me that. But now let's help you get better, right? That's what I need. I, every man in here needs a dude that he can go, hey man, here's everything that's going on in my life. I used to hear people say, if you have five friends by the time you're, like when you die, that you can count on one hand that are your friends. I'm like, dang, five friends? I used to think, well, I got 20 of them. I got so many friends. If you got five, you're blessed. Someone that you can be honest with. That you, they know everything about you and you know everything about them. Every man needs another man he can trust. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, as iron sharpens iron, so does one man to another. You need men that you're honest with. You don't need an accountability partner. You don't need someone that you're confessing fake sins to. You don't need someone that you're performing for and like, I hope they think I'm a good Christian. I no, 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 you just need a dude in your life that you can be real with. Can I, can I get an amen from the guys? And if you've been burned, like I say, you ever got a bad haircut? You ever got a bad fade, guys? You ever got a bad, like, oh my gosh, what just happened? You didn't stop getting a haircut forever. You went back to, you just chose a different barber. Some of you just need to find a new friend. <laughs> In Jesus' name. Can I trust you? Guys are asking this can I, of their wives. When, when God describes a Proverbs 31 woman, he says this, watch this, Proverbs 31, 11. Her husband can trust her, everyone say trust, can trust her and she will greatly enrich his life. Have you ever heard someone say, he just won't open up, he just, he just won't open up, right? Sometimes he's just not that interested in what you have to say. But sometimes, I mean, that's supposed to be funny. Um, you're like... Sometimes he, guys are just like, oh, okay, cool. We're just not, we're not that interested in, I, I love my wife, but sometimes I'm just not that interested. And I'm like, oh, and I want to be, I'm just not. And I, if I'm honest. And Stacy knows, so she's like, oh, you don't care. I do care, I wanna connect with you. I just, I, I just got distracted and I have to refocus. But sometimes it's just not, it's not like our cup of tea. But listen, God wants us to be people that give trust before, listen, you don't have to earn my trust, you earn mistrust. I'll trust, how do you know how you can trust someone? You trust them. And then when they, they, if they break the trust, you go, okay, now I have to put a boundary there because I trusted you and I have to take a step back from this relationship and re reorganize. I don't know if I can trust you with everything, but I trust you first and then I just back up and I say, man, this person's been trustworthy in my life. Ladies, can your husband trust you? Like if he opens up about something vulnerable, are you gonna like use it to, against him in a fight? Are you gonna use it against him next time you get upset at him and say, yeah, I know it's just like that last time because you told me that you blah, 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 blah. And you're like, ah! oh, I just got real, didn't it? Can your, can your husband trust you? And here's the last question, question number three. Every man in here is asking, is it too late? Is it too late for me to be a man of God? Is it, is it too late for me to, like when a man messes up as a husband, dude, oh my gosh, when you mess up, like you know you stepped in it. Like when you know you're accountable, like you messed up, you, you did it, you said it, you went there, you, you looked at that, you went to that place, you, you, you stepped in it and you're like, I messed up and you own it. When a man messes up as a husband, when a man messes up as a father, when a man messes up as a Christian, he's asking the question, is it too late? Because the war, here's what the enemy's saying, you're done, dude. You're done. You used to be, you had it all. You were gonna be a great man of God. You were gonna be a great husband. You were gonna be a great father. But now the enemy's, this is what he's doing. He's warring within you saying, it's too late. Give up. Throw in the towel. You're done. He's whispering at you saying, just quit. You tried and you failed like you always do because you don't have what it takes. It's too late. Give up. And we, if, 
don't, and here's what we do. We believe that sometimes. And guess what? When a man messes up as a husband or as a father, as a Christian, and he knows and he owns it, and the enemy starts tricking him into believing that it's too late, here's what happens. We start believing it over and over and over, and here's what we do. Well, I guess I'm just gonna push all that way down inside, and I'm gonna put it in a box, and I'm never gonna tell anybody about that failure, and I'm just gonna act like it doesn't exist, and we, here's what we do. We compartmentalize that thing, and we put it in a box, and we put it back in our mind, and we put it like in the back, back, back attics of our brain, and we think, well, now it's gone for a little while, and when it comes back up, I'll push it down, and I'm not gonna think about that. And I'm just gonna do my very best to look like I have it all together. And meanwhile, the war wages on within you. Show that picture of that car. I'm gonna show you guys. I thought about how to illustrate this. Anybody know what kind of car that is? It's Tesla, yeah. It's Tesla, Model S. Plaid edition. I thought it was gonna be plaid. I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird, a plaid car. Just the, just the, the screensaver is plaid. But, but the back, the car itself, is, it's a Model S. It's a beautiful car. It's made by Elon Musk's company, Tesla. They go to, they're building spaceships now. That's crazy. They just launched a spaceship on Wednesday. It was crazy. But here's the reality. The Model S, this car will take you from zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds. Some of you guys are like, is that fast? That's really fast. That's like really fast. Like you need your head to be pushed up against the backrest if you headrest it or else you'll break your neck. Like it's fast. And this car is, is, is about $150,000, I think. Like it's like, I can't afford it. Like that car costs more than my first house, okay? So I'm not spending anything, I'm not spending 150K on anything unless it has three bedrooms, two bath and a little backyard. Now this car, imagine for a moment, how many of you guys would like to drive it for a test drive? Just be honest. Someone's like, no, I do not want to go fast. Not me. Most of you are like, heck yeah, that'd be sweet. Now let's just say for example, or for, let's just hypothetically say, your wife came into some money you didn't know about, or your girlfriend or whoever, and she bought you the Tesla S Plaid Edition, 2022, 150K. She just came, she had a rich uncle that died and she's like, I want to, surprise them and you walk out on Christmas day and you're like, oh, what? And you would get in that car and you'd be like, what would you do? You'd take it for a test drive. You'd probably mob over to your friend's house. You'd get out and be like, check out my car. I know it's crazy. She bought it for me. And you'd take it for a test drive and you'd drive all over town and you'd go to Starbucks or you'd go to Active Coffee Co. And you'd go to Chipotle and you'd go and you would just have fun in your car. And then you'd come home and you'd park it right in the driveway and you'd shine it up a little bit and you'd go, all right, I'm gonna go drive that tomorrow. It'd be fun, right? That'd be fun. Imagine the next day you come out and you're like, what in the world? It's got three flat tires. You go, oh my gosh, when I was mobbing through town, I must have gone through some uh, work zone and I picked up three nails. What would you do to those three flat tires? Yeah, you fix them. You fix the Model S tires, those 20 inch, whatever. They, they might cost like 400 bucks a tire, but you, you go, well, dang, I'm kind of like in it already. Like, I'm, I got equity in this thing, might as well drop some money on this thing, you'd put the thousand dollars down easy for some tires. What if the next day you came out and it had a busted up windshield on your brand new Model S Plaid Edition? You're like, dang it, my Model S has a busted windshield. You would take the car to the nearest safe flat repair, safe flat replace. And they would replace your windshield. And you go, oh, gosh, this car's cost me two grand, but hey, I got, it's, it's a beautiful car. I'm not gonna just throw it away. But some of us, we would never throw away a Tesla Model S Plaid Edition because it had a couple busted tires and a busted windshield. So why would you let the enemy trick you into thinking that your life has less value than a Model S Tesla? Because some of you here, you didn't throw away your life, but you're living as if there's no way that you have what it takes and there's no one that you can trust. And you're thinking it is too late for me. And you're living in such a way you're saying, I'm just gonna get rid of it. It's gotten too much to bear. It's gotten too difficult. 
Why would you allow the enemy to trick you into thinking that your life is not worth way more than some $150,000 car? You were made in the image of God. You were created by God for a purpose, for a reason. And just because you've had a few flat tires and just because you had a few busted windshields does not mean that it's time to throw away your life. I'm telling you today, some of you have to wake up and go, you know what? God still's got, he still has a plan for my life and there's still a good thing that he wants me to do even though I've had some, I've had some wrecks in my life and I have a, I've had a few busted up wheels. And I'm here to tell you this morning, Guys, men, we need to listen. We need to stop acting like none of this affects us. We need to stop acting like we're impervious to this stuff. And we need to lean into community now. And we need to be the men of God. Not, not that we need to fight harder and be stronger. No, no, no. We need, here's what we need to do. We need to realize it's not too late. It's not too late if we understand this, that we need to get honest with God. Today, we need to get honest with God. What do you mean? You're, until you get real, God can't heal you. He can't. Until you get honest with God, he'll, he, he can't, he will not heal the thing you will not bring to him. Like a physician, you, if you don't tell the physician that you're sick, how can he heal you? If you don't tell God that you got something going on, he can't, he can't heal you. He's, you have to bring it before God and you have to say, God, I wanna be healed, but it won't happen, I believe, <laughs> until you expose it to the light. Proverb, I'm sorry, Psalms 34 says this, Psalms 34, six. David was a man after God's own heart. Can we agree? David, King David loved God with his whole heart. He was a king of kings. He was a king of, over, of all the kings. To this day, he's still revered in Israel as one of the greatest kings to ever live. And David, the great king, the wealthy king, the powerful king, says this in Psalms 34, 6. This poor man, not this awesome dude, not this strong, powerful king leader. No, this poor man called and the Lord heard him. The Lord heard him. The Lord heard what he was doing. He heard his cries. He cried out to God and the Lord heard him. And here's what happened. He cries out and the Lord heard him. And watch this. He saved him out of all his troubles. He had to cry out to God before God could heal him. He had to cry out to God before God could save him from his troubles. And some of us are so busy lamenting in our own past decisions, our failures, we're asking ourselves, is it too late? Can I trust God? And is it really, am I really, do I really have what it takes to be a Christian? And God's saying, yes, you do. God's saying, you can trust me. And God is saying, it's not too late. If you cry out to God, it's not too late. This man called out to God, David, the man after God's own heart. In Genesis three, goes all the way back to the garden. Let's look at this. At that moment, Adam and Eve's eyes were open to their sin and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So what'd they do? Well, what'd you do when you, when you got in trouble as a kid? And your dad, your mom says, just wait till your dad gets home. What'd you do? You ran when you heard the, your dad's car pull in the driveway, you would run and hide. I did that, right? I'm like, oh gosh, I'm gonna get spanked. He's gonna get the belt. Oh, and I would hide. What did Adam and Eve do? They hid. They felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together and they hid themselves to cover themselves. And it goes on to say, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife, they heard the Lord come, come into the garden. They were like, uh-oh, dad's home. And here's what they did. He was walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord among the trees. And your shame will always cause you to hide. Shame always causes you to, causes you to run away from God, to hide yourself, to, to, to not expose yourself, to be less vulnerable, to be more covered up. And it says this, then the Lord called to the man. Where are you, Adam? 
Where are you, Adam? And I believe God is still asking the same question to some of us today. Where are you? Where are you, men? Where are you, son? And he's not calling him to whoop on him. He's not like, okay, now I gotta wear you out. Go get a switch. He's not calling him because he wants to hurt him. He's calling out Adam, where are you? So that Adam could realize where he was. And God is calling men this morning to say, hey, where are you? I, I, I don't have something bad for you. I actually wanna do something for you right now because your sin and your pain has caused you to ride, run and hide, but I've come here to give you something. And watch this, then, then the man, Adam, who named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. In the garden, watch this, watch this. This is how it ends. In the garden, Satan won that day. He got them to take this fruit. But watch this, God says, no, no, okay, come with me guys, I got a plan. I know you're hiding, hiding yourself. I know you're feeling shame. Come, 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 come on. I can just imagine. He gives them animal skins. We just glaze right over that, right? How do you get animal skins? You gotta kill an animal. God shows them a picture, a foreshadowing. He says, look, come here, come to this altar. See this? See this animal that's living? Because you sin, it's gotta die now. It, it has to die. Because for the wages of sin is death. This isn't like a wink and eye at sin and go, oh, thank God for Jesus. No, no, no. Sin brings death. And God says, look, on an altar, I imagine, the first altar, the altar, the redemptive altar in Genesis chapter three, he kills the animals to show us the consequence of our sin is death. But, 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 he says, see this death? Do you see what your sin caused? But watch this, I'm using this blood and this animal and I'm using this offering and I'm gonna kill this thing and I'm gonna make skins out of it and I'm gonna cover your sin and your shame with the blood of these animals and the skins because I wanna cover you. I don't wanna take you out back and beat you. I wanna, ble I wanna bless you and cover you with my love and my grace and my forgiveness. But something had to die so that you could experience the, the blotting out of your shame. And then 4,000 years later, Jesus would come on the scene and he would be the perfect offering. Again, going to an altar, he would hike up onto a mountain called Golgotha, the place of the, the, of the skull. And he would go up onto this mountain and there would be another altar there. And the sins of man would be so loud for all to see. And people would betray Jesus. His own followers would hurt, would, would, would run from him and desert him. And yet Jesus, the perfect lamb, the spotless lamb, the final propitiation, the final sacrifice for mankind. He said, not my will done, Father, not my will, but your will. And Jesus would go up on an altar. <laughs> Willingly, nobody put him up on that altar and he'd be the final offering for the sins of the world. Do I have what it takes? With Christ I do. Can I trust God? Oh, you can trust God because his love for you was demonstrated in this. While you were hiding in your shame, Christ died for you, Romans 5 says. Can I trust him? 1,000% yes. Is it too late? No, because God will always make a way. And because Jesus, there is always a way maker. And his name is Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the lamb that would take away the sins of the world. So holy is the lamb, holy is the lamb and worthy is our praise. Stand to your feet. Let's worship our King at the altar. Let's praise his mighty name.